Welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter Producers. I'm Rebecca Ford, and I'd like to welcome Peter Chernin, Dan Lynn, Deborah Martin Chase, Emma Tillinger Koskoff, David Heyman, and Charlize Theron. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So I'm going to jump right in here. Um, <coughs> movies are not easy to get made. They sit in development for a long time. You have to fight every step of the way. Tell me how you know a movie is worth fighting for, that you're going to put in the commitment and fight for this film. I think it's, in, it's instinctive. You feel it. If there's sort of an urgency within you that you've got a story to tell, that you're passionate about, and you believe the people that are involved in it with you, the, the, the director, the writer-director, the cast, the people behind the camera. It, when, when you feel that, you know that that's something that you've got to fight for, you've got to push through, and uh, it's worthy of being made. It's got to be about something, for me anyway, something that means something to me mm -hmm. in one way or another. I think, you know, first and foremost, you, got, you have to entertain because you have to get people into the theater. But for me, this is almost a pulpit. And there's, there are messages that I want to get into the world that I think are important that will inspire people that will, you know, maybe even change somebody's life. So, you know, with Harriet, for instance, it's about a woman who couldn't read, couldn't write, was destined to be a slave her entire life and decided, no, that's not going to be my destiny. And if people can, you know, get that message that they have, can control what happens in their lives, that's an important thing, and that's worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. It's usually fear. <laughs> <laughs> Pure panic is what makes me stick around. I find, like, usually the projects that scare me the most are the ones that just don't leave, mm -hmm. you know? They're the ones that kind of haunt you, and I've, I've learned to trust that. I'm like, when something scares the shit out of me, I'm like, I should probably do this. Mm -hmm. And some of them take really long and others happen really fast, but I think that's, that's always been my cage. Mm -hmm. Does this scare me? Mm -hmm. For me, I asked two questions. Why tell this story and why tell it now? Like David, you're talking about like the values and themes of a movie. If they align with my personal values, I think I'm much more motivated in telling that story, but also I look at why tell this story now? And with the Pope, we're in a moment in time when you have two popes, two living popes here at the same time. We have Pope Francis, who's like a rock star pope. There's a story to be told. Uh, the world is in dissension right now, all these different sides fighting, and each of these popes represents a different side, a different point of view, so we felt like now's the time to tell a story because it's gonna resonate with audiences and there's an important message to get out there. So I think timing is important too. Mm -hmm. I think you wake up in the morning ready to fight mm -hmm. these jobs. I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's instinct, you just start fighting. You wake up in the morning, you start fighting with people, <laughs> and you keep going. Some of them totally. you lose eventually, but you just keep fighting, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And you know, I guess on some level you gotta believe in it enough to keep going or you'll give up, but, yeah. but your instinct mode on these jobs is you fight. <laughs> well, on that note, yeah. it doesn't have to be the, your current project, but tell me about it, the biggest fight you've ever waged to get something made or get something you needed for a project and you know, one mm -hmm. that you thought, maybe I, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Of how many, I mean, every one. <laughs> I was like, which one, which is the where hardest do, Where do we start? Journeys, right. <laughs> I mean, listen, this movie took me seven years to um, bring to the screen. I've had another sparkle, took me 12 years. Mm -hmm. And, and any time you're telling a story that may be a little bit out of the mainstream, mm -hmm. it's difficult. I mean, and listen, when you're telling a story about a historical black woman is really tough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, seven years ago, people were glazed over when I brought it up. And as times changed, you know, as Hollywood changed, as the world changed, people became more receptive to the idea that a movie starring a black woman who was, was and will be someday on the face of the $20 bill might be commercial, mm -hmm. had the potential to be, so. It took time. It took time. <laughs> I, I started producing on a, a film called Monster, and it just happened that I felt the need to protect a first-time director mm -hmm. who was really taking a huge risk, right. uh, wrote a very uh, out-of-sorts script. The character was very unusual, and I think initially when we went in to get our financing, it became very clear to me that there was this need for me to step in because I think the financiers actually thought they were basically paying for a hot lesbian movie <laughs> with me and Christina Ricci. Right. And, you know, having the conversations with Patty Jenkins, who wrote and directed it, and knowing what she wanted to do with it, I, I knew that we were going to come up against things. And there were a lot of fights. As soon as I started gaining weight, I had a find one of the financiers call me up. Actually, his wife saw me and she was like, Did you see Charlotte? 
Oh, God. <laughs> Have you seen what she looks like? <laughs> and I got that call, like, what's going on with that? And then this was back in the day where it took, like, three weeks for dailies to make it, make mm -hmm. it back here. And got a call at 3 a.m. from the same guy. We don't have to get into names, but he was like, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, you never smile. <clears throat> you look so angry. You look horrible. And so... You know, you panic a little bit because you're putting yourself out there and you're taking a risk yourself. And when you do that, you're not 100% sure you're taking a chance. Right. So there's a part of you that then second guesses, right? And you're like, shit, well, maybe I did go too far with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you realize you have to stand that ground. You have to, the movie that you set out to make, that's the reason why you went to go make that mm -hmm. film. And that's what you fight for. And I didn't have a friend on that film except for Patty Jenkins. And... That's ne not necessarily how you want to make movies. It's really nice when people actually like each other, yes. and I, I prefer that. But at the end of the day, the movie has to win. Like, that's my philosophy. Mm -hmm. And if it means that you make a few enemies or, along the way, ultimately you want to walk away from it and say, the, the right thing is to do what this movie deserves. Mm -hmm. I was interesting that Peter talks about waking up and it's a fight because I tell my staff every day it's a war out there. And you got to get ready to fight the war. And they think I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. Mm -mm. You know, I think it's a war. To, all of our movies here were tough movies to get made. Yeah. So you're fighting against mm -hmm. the marketplace. The marketplace yeah. doesn't want to make these movies. So you're already going in with people wanting to say no. And I find it's a fight for talent, too. So on The Two Popes, how do I keep my director locked in? You know, it takes a long time from development all the way through to get a movie made. In this case, he sold Fernando Maria, sold the pitch with us. And we were developing, and he wanted to make the movie. And then um, his country, Brazil, asked him to direct the Olympics. Mm. So Watch how am I going to say no to that? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that completely takes you, yes. the director, out of the picture. So we lost him for several years. And like, how do you keep him engaged? How do you make him feel like he's still part of the process, very much shaping the movie? Because he's ultimately our leader. Mm -hmm. And then luckily, the Olympics finished, and then we brought him back. So it's not only a fight against kind of the market, but also like, how do you keep your talent locked in when everyone is chasing the top talent? I think all of us here work with great directors. Yeah. And but, but you know, in that sense, Every moment of it is, is a battle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, making something great is a battle. You know, light disappearing. The yes. actors aren't getting along. Yes. Right. You know, the script isn't quite working in this yes. moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's and, Not you know, money. and what, I, what you come to Never realize is money. these things are so <laughs> fragile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every moment has to be near perfect. And mm -hmm. you only get that by just sort of being relentless about sort of struggling with it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the struggle is noble. You know, without sending too highfalutin, right. it's what you're supposed to do. It's not supposed to be easy. And it's the combination it's of fighting and then also I've, my faith has been reinforced being in Hollywood because at some point you just need, like, the stars to align. It's like you push, 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 and if you head it in the right direction, it's that combination of sheer force of will. I'm going to will this into being. For me, I've I'm been really fortunate this year to work with two incredible directors, writer-directors, mm -hmm. and they are both exacting. You know, they are pushing the envelope every moment of every day in different ways, but absolutely. But it's always a pleasure if you believe in them and what their vision is. So, And them believing in what they're believing, doing and yeah. needing mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. you know, being there to really support that because it's a, it's a scary... Endeavor. You, know. so you don't want to be with people who, for whom fine is good enough. Right. You, know, you want to no. push the envelope. In, you know, again, both films, it's sort of the high wire acts. I, 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 and I think probably for all of our films, yeah. mm -hmm. they're high wire acts. There are moments where they could tip over into, in, in, in the wrong way. And, and that conversation with the director or having faith in a writer director who understand that place mm -hmm. is a really exciting place to be. You know, uh, it's thrilling. Mm -hmm. um, but it's scary, and it's, uh, um, it's uh, and it doesn't necessarily make life easy for the producer or for anybody uh, working on the film. I do want to touch on the sort of power dynamic between the producer and the director. A lot of you are working with directors who have very specific visions. What do you do when they tell you something and you're just not sure that's going to happen? They want a three-and-a-half-hour movie. They have a very specific vision for their story. What do you do? How do you deal with that? Mine is, neither one of mine really takes no for an answer, <laughs> so I have to, I'm trained very well in the Scorsese filmmaking world, um, where I have learned now over 
16 years with him, you know, he's uncompromising and, and extremely exacting. And Silence was insane, that mm-hmm. movie, to get made from start to finish. And I really, I learned so much on that. And I learned, you know, keep them safe and protected in with their actor, actors and cast and in their locations and their sets and making the days, but, but, but maneuvering behind the scenes to somehow make it all make it all happen and that's that's how I that's how I work. I would know. say it's a it's a weird two part struggle. I think it's your job to argue with them mm-hmm. quietly mm-hmm. Sure. and to fight for them externally. Sure. Mm-hmm. Anything mm-hmm. anything involving your director you fight for on the outside. Yeah. And if you disagree with them you argue with them quietly yeah, on the inside. Yeah, let me be clear. We definitely there's a right. lot of in trailer no. uh, really? What? No. <laughs> this is no you kid what? You're kidding me. But then it's like okay, I now know what I need to do when I come out of here. How did you react when the sort of de-aging of the actors came up as the way that that movie was going to be made? Well, we had, you know, we had Pablo Hellman from ILM as our uh, visual effects supervisor on Silence, Mm -hmm. and he had known, he had been reading about this project, and he's the one who approached us and said, I think we can do something. So we, you know, there had been from three, four years of R&D before we decided to make the movie and we saw a test and we saw what it could be and very, very promising what we saw. It was very, very easy technology to work with. You know, there's, there was no head cams, no dots. No, I mean, you were free to do what you needed to do because it was all essentially done in post. The camera rigs were easy to work with. It, it didn't add time to our days. It was, it was actually pretty... When we did the first Apes movie, mm. we didn't see a second right. of Apes until after we'd finished shooting. We basically shot a movie with guys in gray pajamas mm-hmm. jumping totally. around, right, and had no idea. No, uh, on, on Gravity, the same thing. We began the journey of course. Mm. not having a clue how we were going to do it. Um, and we went down some really strange paths and dead ends. But again, I think for all of us here, if you have a director... Um, who you believe in, yeah. you go on that journey. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, you know, like Alfonso or Noah or Quentin or, you know, the, I'm, I'm really lucky to have worked people like yeah. that who, who won't settle, right. who won't take no. And actually, you take a leap of faith because in, in, in your belief in them and, 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 and that they, we will figure well, it out. Well, it's empowering and you want, you want to, you know, you want to go to the mat for them. You want to, you want to do whatever you can to make it happen. They're, they're the, the, the passion and the... <sighs> And the vision is so important, and you you know you, you feel that you know. I also, I think <clears throat> that it's a disservice to your director if you're not honest. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I think I think we sometimes think like, oh, we don't want you know, you don't want to rock the boat. But ultimately, it is your job to, you know, bring what you know or what you've experienced to the table. Correct. And I think it's a it's a huge disservice to your director if you can't if you don't feel like you can be honest mm-hmm. and. And I agree with you know what all of you guys have said. There's a way that you do that, and I think yeah. you also some directors like to just have you be direct. They like the they don't want the small talk. They just want and and they feel comfortable. They're not overly sensitive. And then you have other directors where you have to you have, you you can't use the same recipe for every single Correct. one that you work with. <laughs> and so I think the first you know when you're in that pre-production period, it's really important to kind of like try and gauge what is the best way to communicate with this person because the same way it doesn't work for everybody. And I've definitely found with some directors, sometimes it's better to just not even, don't hammer it. Like like if you just take a step back and let it play out a little bit, they they almost get there on their own. Yeah, absolutely. Without you having to be like, this is never going to fucking work. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and so that's, it's like every time it's like you're you're dating somebody new and you have to kind of treat it that way. It's kind of, it's the art of negotiation. I mean, at the end of the day, you want, you you know you want you need to be honest because if if you're all trying to create the best product, you're you're bringing your point of view, your experience, as you said, and and you and to trust the it should be a relationship of trust that they know you're going to be honest and they're going to be honest mm-hmm. with you because you're both working to this towards the Absolutely. same goal. But you know, in the art of negotiation, everybody's different. Yeah. So you know, to you handle people you know, according to their personalities and, and what you know is going to be most effective and true and get you to the right place. Mm-hmm. Charlize, I know with Bombshell, the financing had some trouble with Annapurna <laughs> as you were going through the process. Tell me what the day, that day was like when you found out that they, they weren't going to back <laughs> oh, in and what you do as a producer that day. <laughs> 
a lot of the miracle of getting a movie made is like having everybody available. And on this film, we aimed really high and had a lot of actors who are very, very busy. Mm -hmm. And so our ske the scheduling was the biggest problem with the financing falling through because was, we were two weeks out from shooting. <sighs> Oh and we had cast everybody, and so beyond that. I mean, we had people working. We had a, two weeks we needed out. a cash flow, <laughs> like you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 And Jay was on. Jay Roach, our director, was on a scout with you know, all of his head of departments. And oh. um, right after I got the news that Annapurna was dropping the film, I, I couldn't call him. I literally couldn't call him. <laughs> I, I called Aaron first. I was like, I, I, there was a part of me that was just so. It was so crushing that I called Aaron first and. And then uh, somebody else called him, and Jay, Jay was like, no, I know about it. And I was like, oh, God, right. don't get demoralized. Right. Like, we're going to do this. Right. Like, you're just trying to, like, patch the pieces together. But I, I do think sometimes things happen for a reason. Again, I'm lucky. I think we all, right, you, you're lucky when you can pick up the phone and call a, a previous financing partner yeah. that you've had a great experience with. And in this case, it was Braun, and mm -hmm. I called Aaron Gilbert right after I got the news that Annapurna was dropping the film. And I just said, do you, can you put your cape on and come and rescue me? <laughs> and I've had great experiences working with him and there's That's a great. level of trust there. So, you know, he, five hours later he called me back and he said, we'll do it. And wow. then, you know, within two days we, we knew we had the financing. And then uh, there was a real interest in the film. So that was not the, the, the problem. Like, and I think ultimately, we made that movie the exact way that it was supposed to be made. Have any of the rest of you had sort of that 11th hour panic when things are on any of your films that you had to sort of yeah. scramble yeah. to get done? I mean, I had it on Joker, but on many, many, many 11th I mean, it hour scrambles. it always happens. Mm -hmm. Or you get that last minute, you know what? We're, you know, you're always over budget. So it's like, we gotta figure out how to take out, you know, X million dollars to get yeah. to like get the green light and you're like a few weeks out. So you're like, what are we, you know, what are we cutting? What are we, you know, it, that's the nature of the beast almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's a sort of misconception that there's a sort of formal moment of green lighting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's you just keep going forward yeah. Yeah. Yes. and yeah. don't ever let them stop you. That's mm -hmm. right. You know, um, but there's no moment where <clears throat> they go, okay, you're green lit and then leave you alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just you're sort of constantly plugging in you know, you, they got, you got to force them to stop you. But it's yeah. funny because it's like, really? You don't think we know we're actually greenlit? Right. We're now you're however many well, and millions and in and, and we're four weeks out money. and you're still pretending like we're not greenlit? Right. I love that. That's right. my favorite game. Mm -hmm. well, I think like, back okay. to what Charlize was saying, where basically you push, 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 don't give up, complete determination, and then you also have to know when you, it's time to just say, okay, you know what? Time to pivot, yeah, like, right. and and the and the wisdom to know yeah. the difference between the two, because sometimes you you can be pushing yourself over the cliff, yeah. right? And usually I have learned, and this is where the experience comes into play, that when I get to that point, I instinctively know, mm, take one, just just stand down for a second, mm -hmm. and I'm, where I'm going to end up has always been better yeah. than where I would have gone. We were a day away on the day that we were supposed to sign the contract for a straight to video with Blockbuster on on Monster because no distributor would pick it up. Mm. Literally the lawyer was coming to the editing room and Patty and I were gonna sign the agreement was the day that we got a call from Bob Burney and Passion of the Christ was pushing. Uh, Mel wanted to go back and shoot six, six more scenes and it was like a six month push and those those things happen when you can't when you stop kind of like mm -hmm. tr trying to right. mm -hmm. where you almost just you have to give up and surrender and right. just go but then magic happens. And I, th I think, mm -hmm. you know, we always say that it is a little bit like w we work in a business where we're trying to constantly capture that lightning in a bottle, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. if it was all about just manufacturing it, then I think everybody would probably be able to do it. Exactly. There is a level of this thing that happens that mm -hmm. you can't control, that you can't, that you have to always make room and space for, but, and also don't just rest on those laurels. Yeah. But, right. but that's usually when, great things can happen. Yep. When Charlize talks about give in and surrender, I think that's like a huge thing for us. I think all of us here are probably control freaks <laughs> and want to control everything. Yeah. And, and part of being a producer, sometimes you do have to give up I'm and not, surrender. You're I not, am <laughs> not at all. Major. Not uh, a I'm a major one. And so in our case, it was a difference <laughs> between Bombshell and our movie. Our issue was not a green light issue, but in the middle of shooting, we took a huge hiatus. 
Mm -hmm. It was much longer than we expected. So we shot in Rome, and there was expected hiatus, and it ended up being much longer for weather Why was issues. Why longer? Yeah. Weather issues, some oh, uh, scheduling issues. Got it. And then so we're like, are we even gonna be able to finish the movie? We right. have actually two halves mm. of the movie. Right. And so that's when you have to just kind of give up and surrender. Going, okay, it's all just gonna come together at the right time in the right place, but just, there's nothing you can really do right. at a certain point. How so long did it end up being? Ended up being four months. Wow. Oh wow. my goodness. Yeah. That's really. Yeah. So luckily everyone came back. And everybody and, came back? Yeah, but it was right. tough to make sure everyone's who, schedules. Who ended up gaining weight? <laughs> <laughs> but what, and what about no you, like the key crew? All came back? back. They like, took jobs in between and came they back? They all came back. Amazing. Wow. David, I do want to ask you about working with Quentin on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's obviously such an ambitious film. What was the one thing he really wanted or needed that you had to make sure you delivered for him? Well, I had great partners as producers. I had Shannon McIntosh, who'd worked with him a while, and Georgia mm -hmm. Kakandis, um, who had been on the project actually even longer than me. Um, so I think for all of us, it was giving, you know, Quentin is very detailed and uh, is pushing the envelope, and, and, and he wanted to recreate L.A. of his childhood with great specificity. Mm -hmm. And things like you know, turning Hollywood Boulevard into how it looked in right. 1969. While some of it looks like it did, an awful lot of it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to work with all the local um, vendors. Mm -hmm. um, but Quentin, to his credit, you know, he went down and spoke to the Hollywood, you know, the, the city of Hollywood. He actually really engaged in the process. And that's the thing about Quentin. He doesn't sit back. He steps forward in every which way. He, and so as a and producer... you made a movie with him before this? Nope, the first time. It was my first dance, and uh, <laughs> it was about as much fun as I've ever had on any movie in my life. The crew is his family. He treats everybody in front of and behind the camera the same, with great, great respect. Mm -hmm. um, and he's demanding of everyone. You know, if you don't pull your weight, you know, you'll, you'll know. Mm -hmm. you're, you're supporting his vision, but he at the same time, you know, um, is, is open to suggestions and um, the, the mistakes or things that happen during the day mm -hmm. and embracing those. It, yeah, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Peter, you also had to sort of recreate these extremely intense car racing scenes. What about that was sort of the most challenging for you? Well, the thing that was crazily challenging is those race scenes we shot generally in four different locations. Mm -hmm. Um, at different times, months apart. So we'd show the cars going into the turn in one mm. location. We'd show them in the turn later. We had to, Le Mans doesn't look anything today, what it looks like. So we sort of had an idea of how to recreate the racetrack. We built the grandstands in an airport up uh, in Santa Clara, yeah. not far from here. And we were shooting them months apart with different cars. And you know, so it was incredibly complicated to sort of just get the choreography of the race going on. And how much is driving is Christian Bale doing himself in this movie? He's doing very little driving. <laughs> <laughs> He's driving to work in the morning. <laughs> Actually, funnily enough, driving is a big part of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, we watched quite a lot of films about uh, Los Angeles in 1969 and driving shots. Brad loved driving along Hollywood Boulevard and, you know, the freeway uh, filled with cars from 1969 and thereabouts, being able to go at much faster than he would be uh, <laughs> normally. Ironically, Brad was attached to Ford versus Ferrari oh, really? at one point. Right, yeah. and Tom Cruise was also Tom Cruise attached? Tom Cruise was attached, Brad huh. was attached. It's had like five directors. Yeah. I think it's about wow. 15 yep. years in development mm -hmm. of the movie. Did Tom fall out because he wanted to make it about planes? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, guys, I have a great idea. <laughs> Tom just wants yeah. to do anything fast. Yeah, right? it's true. Right. Peter, tell me how you deal with that when someone like Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt drops out of a project. Does it feel like a, a loss or are you, it's just part of the system for you? You know, this was one of those things where we were different people. You know, it's one of those things where you're just trying to line up mm -hmm. a couple of actors, mm -hmm. a director, mm -hmm. a studio financing and drive a nail through it at the right, right time. Mm -hmm. And so people were coming in and out. It was, it was originally Michael Mann's project right. for a mm -hmm. long time. And, um, and so... People, you know, it was just sort of trying to get them all to line up. And right. it wasn't so much people dropping out as you were just trying to get it all to mm -hmm. be in sync at the same time. You know, there's been some discussion about the star, the value of a star. Is it like it was, you know, a few years ago? How important is it to have that name leading your movie? What do you think? Does it still need a big movie star like Tom Cruise or someone to get a movie made these days? 
depends on the movie. Like mm, I think right? so, yeah. I mean, I, you know, here, you know, Harry Tubman, mm -hmm. and it was about finding the right actor. Right. Because the movie lives and breathes on that performance. So I'd actually saw Cynthia in The Color Purple before the Tony nomination, mm -hmm. blew me away, and I was like, this is Harriet Tubman. I mean, mm -hmm. just the breadth of her talent was clear. Everything about her was right. And when I sat with her a couple weeks later, I was like, this is, my, this is, our, this is our actress. And, uh, and it was a risk in that sense, but it wasn't a risk because she was the one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the two popes, it was critical. I mean, Stuber, I love him. And he was very clear with us saying, this is the cast that you need to get and you'll get the green light. It was Jonathan Price and uh, Anthony Hopkins, there was literally no backup. This, if you want the green light, this is the assignment. So I appreciated the honesty, oh, wow. but also, okay, it's very clear as a producer, this is the assignment. You lay these actors, you have a green light, you don't, you have no movie, but it's mm -hmm. very very specific in that case. Interesting. In general, I think it's less important than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the movies speak for themselves, and in general, Actors don't drive box office as much as they used to. That's right. No, it's an international no. market now. Yeah, yeah but, it's not a domestic market. But there are certain movies, certainly once upon a time, hard to imagine it without sort of big name movie stars. And right. I think the same thing with our movie. Yes. You know, they just felt like, you know, they're, they're very similar movies in a lot of ways, which they felt sort of old fashioned mm -hmm. Hollywood movies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in ways, and hard to imagine either of them without big cast. But in general, the sort of need for movie stars, I don't think is what it was. Mm -hmm. Emma, uh, you touched on this a little bit. Obviously, Joker has been a huge box office success, yeah. but there was some controversy around it. Did yeah. you see that coming as a producer when you were working on it? Uh, not, not while we were making it, really. The trouble didn't start brewing until we started, screen until we, until we screened it really for the first time and just wanted to be very, very aware and careful given the, you know, the, the subject matter and, uh, yeah, it's been it's been it's been interesting. I'm I'm just glad that we opened and mm -hmm. all quiet <laughs> quiet on the western front. It looks front. like the weight has been lifted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Box <laughs> office has been amazing, yeah. so that's wonderful. But just that, um, but I'm, sometimes you don't know, right? And then sometimes you do, and you have to literally just like strap on your flak jacket and lean into it. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, we just made a movie, and I'm sure we're gonna have yeah. numerous lawsuits. Exactly. <laughs> it's like at some point you have to just go. If that happens, then that happens. Right. And ultimately, again, like, did you stay on the road of you know what you wanted to achieve? Is that 100%. is that is that really the film? And did you do that with integrity and hard work of m making sure that the research was there? And you know, I I've never understood when people are like, well, it's a true story. And it's like, well, hold on, like, mm -hmm. it's never really a true story. Right. Uh, it is. It's you're you're right. you're you're chasing the greater truth, Correct. Right? right? Because in intimate conversations, you're never going to know what that is, right? So, that's always where I I find myself whenever we do these kind of like you know real life movies where you just have to kind of make peace with that and 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 do as much work as you possibly can, and mm -hmm. then when everybody starts saying, well, don't do that because we're going to get sued, it's like. Well, maybe we should get sued then. Well, maybe we should get sued. Right. It, yes, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, I hope nobody sues. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I'm inviting it in, but I, I think you have to, you, you have to be pragmatic yes. about what that looks like. I was just saying, you do your best to protect yourself, and and as long as everybody is on the same side, your yes. financier, your distributor, yes. so that you're all in, you know facing it together. That's yeah. maybe you don't just be hanging out mm -hmm. there by yourself. Yeah, I started looking at stuff and I was like, oh boy, because you know, I don't do deep dives into the dark webs and stuff. But, you know, it was like, I was like, oh God, maybe this movie's never gonna see the light of day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, two weeks out from our opening, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, I really commend Warner Brothers. They really, you know, stuck right by our side yeah, and, and, and never wavered, never yeah. wavered. I think they handled it beautifully and it was... You have to be careful too online. You know, we have experiences with Aladdin. You can't do the deep dives. I don't you look just at never that. know, is it a minority speaking yeah. from the majority? Mm -hmm. Are there online trolls? Right. Like, yeah. I just found when I start getting it, I gotta just step out. Also, there's, you talk about the dark, there's a lot of just darkness and we're in an environment now, everyone wants to take people down and they yeah. feel better about themselves. And so I think it's, I don't know, I think as a producer, part of it is just, okay, engage a little bit, understand what's going on in the world, but I think it's important just to, not to go down the rabbit right. hole. Right. 
You never know. It might be a few people speaking for It's because it's the anonymity. You know, people can say these ugly, horrible things because they're not being held accountable for it. So you have to keep it in context. Mm -hmm. Also, if you feel like people think they can predict a movie, like, you know, they hear a title or the casting or the director, and then all of a sudden they, it's like they know exactly what the movie Mm -hmm. is going to look like. And I think it's it's such an unfair position for films. It's also a fun challenge because it is a little bit like, like you get to like rub it in their face. Yes. The end. But I think when when you do something that is controversial, that's maybe a story like Bombshell, like there was definitely this idea, this confidence that came across that you just like, oh, you're so confident that you think you know what this movie is, that this is actually going to be a really nice surprise. Mm-hmm. Right. And what a nice challenge. Let's take something, a subject matter like sexual harassment and turn that on its head so it doesn't feel like the thing that you think you're going to see right. or the thing that, that is the medicine that we're going to ask you to take. But how do you make it entertaining? Yeah. Right. Ultimately, that was the thing that I relished the most was every day going to work, with our incredible cast and then having Jay Roach as that shepherd and knowing that what he was going to do with the story was totally going to be something that nobody could predict. Could predict. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, we approach from the very beginning, Harriet is not a movie about slavery. It's a movie about freedom and empowerment <laughs> and one woman's drive to change her life in the world. And so people, like, they don't see them. That, that, again, that's because it's, they have the anonymity. They haven't seen the movie. They don't even know what it's about. And they're already saying, well, we don't want to see this and we don't want to see that. Mm-hmm. Everybody's well, a filmmaker, <laughs> right? Everybody's a critic. Yeah, everybody's a critic. Everybody's a, critic. Everybody's totally. a filmmaker, I you know. know. Ultimately, you have to bet on your own gut on these things. Yes, you have to sort absolutely. of say, I'm not an alien. I'm, I'm a human. I, I, I'm emotional. I want to yes. laugh. I want to cry. Yeah. I want to be moved by things. Mm-hmm. And take a sense of responsibility. I believe yeah. that this is a responsible telling of this story. Absolutely. It may indeed be controversial, but I believe it's controversial for a reason. Mm-hmm. And then... Hell with it. Mm-hmm. Hopefully yeah. it'll work, and it may not work. Absolutely. But you know, you can't, you can't sort of second guess. You know, it's look. I always used to say that you know these these jobs are wildly subjective, yeah. with one exception, which is you know your own thoughts and feelings That's remarkably right. well, and it's the one thing you know with certainty, and you know when you read this read the script for the first time that mm-hmm. this thing moves me, or yes. this thing is exciting, or this thing is mm-hmm. funny, or whatever those things are. And that's the least subjective thing in the whole process. Yeah. And in a world of complete subjectivity, your own yeah. gut is the one thing you know objectively. Right. And you should listen to it and bet on it. Right. And actually, I don't think con- controversy is a bad thing. No. I think, no. uh, right. you know, in a world where, um, that we live in, which is there's not much conversation, mm-hmm. there's only polemic, I think to actually put things out there that encourage a conversation of some kind or other is really healthy. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's important. I agree. I mean, my mentor in this business is a man named Frank Price. And that's precisely what he taught me, among many, many things, was at the end of the day, trust my gut. Mm -hmm. You know, educate my gut so that I'm understanding what's going on in the marketplace and obviously what's going on in the world. But at the end of the day, it's about emotion. It's about connecting with your material with people. And if I'm connecting with it in in a really important and intimate way, probably other people mm-hmm. will too. Yeah. But isn't that true of every step of the process? Totally. You have to trust your instinct because totally. otherwise you're not going to be able to, you, you're choosing a piece of material for a third person, it's commercial. That's not, it's got to, you've got to Absolutely. have a personal reason for doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then every step of the way, who you work with, um, the conversations you have with the right, it's all personal and yeah. subjective. That's mm-hmm. the only way you're going to be able to make your case. That's right. When I think death is when you approach something cynically saying, I don't really like this, but they'll like it yeah. Yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. That is death. Yeah. Yes. 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 Right? Yes. death. Absolutely. And, yes. You know, I've made movies like that in my life, and I'm ashamed to them. Yeah. 25 years later, I'm right. ashamed of them. Yeah. Wow. Do you want to say which ones? <laughs> no, <'cause we're> <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So three of the movies here are being released by Netflix, which has been a major disruptor in the industry for the last few years. Did any of you pause before signing on to work with them? We, we did not pause. Mm-hmm. We, um, Marty and Bob were determined to get this film made. Stuber's been trying desperately to get you know, theatrical, you know, negotiating all of that. We were promised that we would have something. Mm-hmm. And that was okay for Marty, mm-hmm. you know? And he knew what he was getting into and happy to explore that, uh, that experience. And Scott is the most supportive um, and Ted Sarandos, the most supportive, and we just had a, a, a great time and are still having a great time, and I would do every movie with them. 
hands down. I love them. So we didn't have a pause, but we took our, our pitch out to market based on uh, Anthony McCartan's original play. Yeah. And so we had multiple bidders. So we did have a conversation, though. Do we go traditional or do we go streaming? And in this case, with Fernando, our director, we wanted as many people to see the movie as possible globally. And right. we knew it was a hard movie to get made and a hard one to get people to go to the theater for. It's a faith-based movie that plays to believers and non-believers alike. But with Netflix, as you guys know, it's day and date all over the world. Yeah. So we ultimately mm -hmm. thought that was the best way to get people to see it. Yeah. For us, when Stuba called and said, we want to do it, there was not a moment's hesitation. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll all say this, you know, the support in the process of making the film Incredible. and the support in distributing the film, marketing distrib distributing the film has been incredible. incredible. A film like Marriage Story um, is, you know, would never be seen, as Dan said, by as many people, uh, heard about by as many people as it would without the marketing of, a, of, of Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, their support from Stuber and yeah. Ted to Lisa Tayback and their marketing oh, yeah. and Julie uh, has been unwavering. Mm -hmm. And also their, their, their analysis and understanding, I'm not talking analytics, I'm just yeah. talking creative, of every single aspect of the process yeah. has been really, really impressive. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are great partners. And like you, I would make another yeah. film there in a heartbeat. With us, they've, um, the condition of, of, of making it was that they would guarantee us um, a significant distribution. So. We, we get four weeks, I, mean, yeah. I think like you, we yeah. get, you know, we're up for a month prior to going on, on, on the service. Um, we begin small, we right. expand, yeah. and then in a way the going broad is, the, is, is going wide is when we, when, when we go hit the streaming. But they're also talking about keeping in the theatres through February, March, well, April. Isn't Roma, Roma still Roma in, is still in still some theatres? theaters. Mm. It's like so, so, I mean, clearly they are about... The, the you know the service and that's the most mm -hmm. important thing for them. But they also want to attract filmmakers and support the filmmaking ex yeah, e experience absolutely. and mm -hmm. and the theatrical experience. F so yeah. for, for 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 me, it's been for us, for Noah, for me. Yeah. For the, I do think there's a misconception about Netflix though, because filmmakers come to me and say, "Hey, if you work with Netflix, do you get no notes? Do you get to do whatever you want to do?" No. And for for us, it's you get the right notes. It's like the right amount of touch. I think it's it's a parallel to the conversation we talk about being a producer and working with a director. They give you the right notes and they step into the right points, but it's yeah. probably not as aggressive yeah. uh, with yeah, notes and um, touch as with a traditional student. Mm -hmm. Correct. I, I think the, the marketplace has also changed mm -hmm. significantly, and it is really hard for a lot of these, whatever you call them, smaller movies, to find any home in the marketplace yeah. right now. I think between okay. the price-value relationship of Netflix on the one hand, where people go, should I take my family out and spend 100 bucks right. on right. movies, or yeah. should I subscribe to Netflix for a year for... 120 bucks. Right. Yeah. And then on the other side, you get squeezed by Disney superhero movies, which yeah. it's mm -hmm. really hard to find a weekend mm -hmm. to get open on. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a lot of these sort of smaller, more specialized movies, you get look. I made this sweet little movie in the spring called Tolkien. Mm -hmm. We got killed. You know, five years ago, that movie would have done 50, 60 million dollars worldwide, mm -hmm. and I think we did 15, 20. Mm -hmm. There's just no one's going out to the movie theaters for these small movies. Right. Well, right. and there's no stigma. Anymore. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, initially it was, oh, God, you know, my movie is worthy of theatrical. No, it's about what is the right distribution platform right. to get as many people as possible to see the movie. Mm -hmm. I know? think for, the, for both Quentin and, and Noah, who both shoot on, on, you know, on film, uh, the theatrical sp experience is very important for both of them. But again, to Netflix's credit, they understood that. Mm -hmm. They understood the filmmaker they were working with, right. and they gave them what gave him what he wanted to the best it's, of their the, yeah. ability. Yeah. I think that's the, that's what's so important is that they understand when they're working with certain filmmakers that there's a there's a, there's something there that you have to kind of re respect and surrender to. Like if you're going to work with somebody like David Fincher totally. or these filmmakers, and they're they're they don't just re resentfully do it. They do they they invite it. They yes. know they that that's it. the right thing yeah. to do mm -hmm. because ultimately that's how you. I mean, that's, we all know that, right? Once you support and give your director the things that they need, ultimately that's how you make a great right, film. It's right. when you try to step in there and be like micromanaging everything. Right. Mm. I've, I've had a great experience with them too. I, I started with television and I mean, David Fincher, who I did Mindhunter with, he just had such, I mean, he basically like <laughs> launched yeah, Netflix yeah. and so he was like the the first person to really I think tap into this important role that uh, that entity would kind mm -hmm. of carry. I remember so vividly 
like 25 years ago working with Tom Hanks, and he wrote in my script, promise me you will never do television. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? Oh 25 years ago. Wow. And look at him now. He can't stop making television. <laughs> <laughs> right? But it is, when I, when I was starting out in this industry, I mean, it was thought of as like, yeah. you, oh, you know, totally and now it's, all, I want to almost say the reverse. Absolutely. Like it is, a lot of these places are, shaking us and waking us up mm -hmm. to how we need to bring back a little bit more bravery. We need to push the envelope. We yeah. need to do scary things because when you make television, those are the things that are really encouraged. Yes. Those are the things that they almost expect. And I, yes. it wasn't until I started producing television that I would sit in pitch meetings and hear people go, well, can you go further with that? And usually it was the reverse when it was when you were trying to sell a film. Right, pull it back. It was, oh, can you pull back on yeah. that? Pull yeah. back on that. And I think it's been a good thing for us to wake up and go, well, we need to bring this back into our industry. Mm -hmm. We need to start challenging the, right. the status quo and what that is and stop being so risk protective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the key to longevity in this business, whether you're Marty Scorsese or you're us, is paying attention to what the changes that are taking place. Yeah. You have I mean, to right stay now, current. You have to stay current. You have, you have to, to stay, stay current. open. You have to stay nimble. I mean, the technological changes now are happening in yep. every day. Something's different. You know, the marketplace is changing. Back, in, like you said, back in the day when I started out and I was doing television. And people were like, why are you doing TV? Yeah. I mean, like it was bringing down my, you know, my brand at that point. Now, then it was like, oh my God, you were in TV early. You know? <laughs> so it's just, you have to just keep mindful of what's going on and move with it. Move yeah. with the times, push forward. Yeah. That's what I love about Marty at 77 yeah, years old. I mean, he's, he's, he's relevant. He's totally. He's, He's not afraid to try anything new. He's just he's just rolls What's with it. What's the secret? I just saw him in Telluride. He had more energy than the rest of the room. It's is it diet? Or... <laughs> it's a diet. It's what is, what is it a pill? Him? It's yeah. not. <laughs> Trust me, it's not. Believe me, okay. it's it's his just you know. I think he loves passion. what he does. He yeah. loves what he does. He loves it's what he does. Total passion. It's like yeah. trying to get him off the set is like oh my god, you know he he'll shoot 16, 17 hour days easily. It's so inspiring. Mm. It was great on Irishman because we had others who couldn't quite, you know, keep, keep up, up that pace. <laughs> so, um, but uh, you know, 108 days of that is, uh, you know, wow. no, it's 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 his passion. You know, there's nowhere he'd rather be than 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 on that set. Mm -hmm. You know, and the fact that he can still operate at the highest yeah, level with all the, you know, the 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 respect yeah. at that age, you're like, why not? Yeah. David, when it comes to Marriage Story, that's a very personal story for the director, Noah Baumbach. You know, he had been through divorce himself, his parents had been divorced, um, and he's a filmmaker who needs a lot of time to make a film. What sort of demands did that put on you? It was a personal story for Noah, but it's also a personal story for so many people working on the film, and I think it's a personal story for many people we, he knew. Mm -hmm. uh, Noah interviewed a lot of people. He always had um, Adam Scarlett and Laura involved and spoke to them about divorce because, um, and about marriage. Mm -hmm. But for, for, for me, in terms of my role, the most important thing was Noah likes a, a very intimate set mm -hmm. and a very quiet set. Um, Quentin's a more expansive character. Both of them don't allow mobile phones on set, which, by the way, I recommend really mm -hmm. highly. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was about creating an environment where Noah and the actors could have the quiet and the intimacy and the space mm -hmm. to create. Mm -hmm. Noah does a lot of takes, he takes time, so mm -hmm. in terms of the schedule it was allowing for that. And Noah's direction is quite invisible, it's not a, uh, it's not, doesn't draw much attention to itself, right. but, but every choice, every decision is, you know, is considered. And so it's again allowing um, he, he, all those pieces have to work together yeah. and he needs the time and the space to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We started um, talking about how hard it is to make a movie. Do any of you have a project that is the one that got away, a movie you're still hoping to make that's been yep. stuck? <laughs> I, think, I think we all do. Yeah. 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 Tell me about the Peter, but you've got. I bought the rights to Travis McGee mm. when I was running the studio close to 30 years ago. Uh -huh with Harrison Ford attached, and there must be $25 million of development costs against it. Every <laughs> screenwriter in Hollywood has worked on it. But you don't give up. Mm -mm. No, you just... We're going to get it made one of these days. Yeah, you just yeah. know you will. <clears throat> the stars will align. So Rebecca, I want to knock on wood so I don't jinx myself, but we're trying to make the last Lethal Weapon movie, 
and Dick Donner is coming back. The original cast is coming amazing. back. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just amazing. The story itself is very personal to him. Wow. Mel and Danny are ready to go, so it's about That's amazing. the script. Oh my God, so. amazing. David, you got one in your pocket? I've, um, I've, there was a book called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Mm -hmm. yeah. We optioned around sure. 25 years ago. Um, and we hired a writer-director, um, and he spent around nine or 10 years writing it, um, but he never actually got to write it. And, um, and then it's just a journey, a time of about trying to find the right person, people to, uh, um, I'm doing it with Plan B, uh, mm -hmm. who are great partners. In fact, we had the book for so long that they only allowed us to extend it, provided we gave them the option to do the play. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and interesting. thankfully they did. I, uh, I was approached by Park Chang-wook, like, oh God, around 2005, mm -hmm. and he basically handed me the rights to one of his trilogies on vengeance, uh, Sympathy wow. for Lady Vengeance, mm -hmm. which was just so unbelievable. But he came to me and said, I would love for you to try and tell this in a Western, as a Western story. And, and that's, that's been the biggest challenge, but it's definitely a project that is like, I just, I have to just figure out how to get this right. <laughs> and it's, it's been many years. And in a weird way, it's, I think it's good because, um, the character goes to prison for a long time. And I, th I think if I had made this movie, you know, 12 years ago or 13 years ago, I think it would have been different. I think, I think it's all playing out the way it's supposed to. That's what I, at least what I'm telling myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's a book called The Black Calhouns, which is written by Gail Lumette Buckley, who is Lena Horne's daughter, mm -hmm. that I have been trying to make for a very long time. And I, it will stay in my pocket until I get it done. Emma, do you have one? We have a ton. I mean, tons. That, yeah. that, I mean, there's millions in, in development and millions that Marty have, has, you know, wanted to, to make over right. the years. But the one was the one that we finally got made was Silence, Silence and yeah. that was the big one. And that sort of that that we had to we had to do, and thankfully we did it. So there is hope, and you will get it done. There's too many. There's. Th I always say to him, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to make some cuts here, buddy. We can't, <laughs> we can't keep trying to get all these made. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was the big one, and, and that was 30 years, and it wow. came together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'd love to hear about what is something from your childhood, a value or a skill, or something from your childhood that you have taken that has made you a great producer. <laughs> um, Reading. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'm a great producer, by the way. But, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're here, you're a great <laughs> producer. <laughs> but, but reading. Okay, that's a good one. I think mine was um, being raised by wolves, essentially, and having to fend for myself very early on. I love you, <laughs> Mom and Dad, no offense, but honestly, um, just having to really um, produce my life from a very early age. Okay. My dad was the biggest film and television buff that I knew, so... Mm -hmm. He instilled in me a love of a passion for film and, and television and an understanding of its impact, how the images that are on screen are just so uh, important, positively and negatively. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Taiwan. And so coming here, it's part of, I think, diligence. Just I felt like I, had to, I was an outsider. I had to work harder and I had to learn the system. And I think that's helped me in producing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm an immigrant as well. I, I was born and raised in South Africa, and I I, I lived in a, a in a lot of isolation, like a, on a farm, only child. But my my mom, I think, picked up early on that I w was a storyteller, and I think that you know her encouragement, whether it was like putting me in dance and. Ultimately, that's where I felt like I learned how to be a good storyteller. If you can do it without saying anything, then I think you're right. you're mm -hmm. ahead of the game, mm -hmm. and that's probably more powerful. But I can really like sit with things and not feel overwhelmed by them, and I think it's because of how and where I was raised. Yeah, David. Um, very much like you, books. Um, but I was raised in an environment where curiosity was encouraged. Um, where I watched a ton of films and have a, you know, a love of cinema, but also art and theatre and actually travel, meeting people who were different. And the big thing, I think, was it's okay to be different mm -hmm. and yeah. celebrating difference. Yeah. And um, that people are people, 
the world over and to treat people with respect no matter who they are, Absolutely. no matter where they're from. Yeah. So to me, I think that was the great lesson that my parents taught me that yeah. uh, hopefully I try and apply to the work that I do. Mm -hmm. It's so lovely what you just said. It reminds me, when I was working with Jay Roach, when we had our first like big meeting with all of our department heads, he said something like that. He said, be kinder than this, than what is necessary. Yes. It was so beautiful. I love, I love that's, that. That's sort of my mantra and how I run my set is yeah. just everybody needs to... Like exactly. let's let's have fun. It's hard enough, you know. It's a hard job. Exactly. Like, let's just really we all have challenges. Band and together. We're all yeah. Lucky. Yeah. yeah. Totally. We are lucky to we be really doing are. what we yeah. do. Perspective. Yeah. 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 What is the one film you would tell every aspiring producer to watch? Oh God! I knew we were going to get one of these. <laughs> Got <laughs> one. I knew it. Aspiring producer. Producer specifically. Yes. I think you watch mean? as much as you possibly can. I agree. Yeah, I don't absolutely. think there's one I would film. Say don't no. stop. Yeah, I, I think watch bad movies. Watch I bad say movies. Watch yeah. yeah. bad <laughs> because yeah. you learn from yes. the mistakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's like I mean, I'm a lawyer, and so you know, there's legal precedents. Well, the film, other films are the precedents here. You know what works, what didn't work. It just watch mm -hmm. as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And you're right, Shirley. Watch a lot of bad movies, yeah. so you know not you know not what to do. not to do. Mm -hmm. right. The one I'd recommend is actually a documentary, and many of you have probably seen "Hero Dreams of Sushi." Yes. Yeah, yeah. because he's a sushi master. Yes. But I think those are the kinds of people we work with: perfectionists, yes. you know, directors, actors, other producers, other craftsmen. Mm -hmm. And if you can see kind of the mentality and the drive of someone like Hero, then you can work with those people. So that actually was very informative for me. Good also, answer. he's aspiring to perfection, but he never achieves it. Correct. And I think that that's true of every filmmaker and every producer and yeah. anybody working is we reach and we are ambitious. Yeah. But um, I, there's not a film that I've made that I haven't looked back and went, ooh, if it was <laughs> 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 Still, uh, yeah. Always. Um, it's life. Always. It's life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Peter, you didn't give an answer. You got a film? <laughs> I, you know, probably I'd say Titanic, mm -hmm. just because it was such an extraordinarily impossible production. Mm -hmm. Right. It was a tall order. Yeah. It was yeah. insanely <laughs> difficult, challenging, and sort of threw every imaginable problem at, mm -hmm. at trying to make a movie. And, you know, at the same time had as big an impact as arguably yeah. any movie in history. Yep. And so it sort of both shows you the promise of what you could potentially achieve, but it was hell. Even now you still feel that? Many years later. Well, it was, you know, when was the last time you saw it? I haven't seen it in a while. I see bits and pieces of it, but yeah, yeah it was that. when I greenlit it, it was the most expensive movie ever made. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we went more over budget than the budget was. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Wow. 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 Just in, just wow. in production or with in, your. Most in production, yeah. Yeah. We won $105 million. Oh, as a director, wow. he would not take no wow. for that. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. But it was also a great lesson because it was a. Yeah sort of out-of-body experience, which is everything public about the movie mm -hmm. was a disaster. Mm -hmm. And every personal interaction I had, I thought it was phenomenal. It was a mm -hmm. phenomenal pitch. It was a phenomenal script. It was phenomenal dailies. Look, in that sort of situation, you've got three alternatives. Shut it down entirely. That seemed like a bad idea. $140 right. million dollars in. Right. Right. Replace the director. <laughs> seemed like a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Or try and make it great. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it just seemed to me, it seemed clear to me the only hope was to make it great. Mm -hmm. You're right, you do have a good gut. <laughs> <laughs> Very good gut. Very good. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you Hi, I'm Deborah Martin Chase. Hi, I'm Dan Lin. I'm Peter Chernin. Hi, I'm Charlize Theron, and thank you for watching. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you for watching the Hollywood Reporter Roundtable. The Hollywood Reporter Roundtable. Roundtables on YouTube. On YouTube.